guys. We are going to finish up Unit 6 and Learned Behavior with a discussion of operant conditioning. So this is going to be our last set of notes for the unit before you take your test, so let's get into it. It's really important that we take a look at, before I move into the, explaining this definition here, the other two types of learning that we've covered. We've discussed classical conditioning. We've talked about how that is learned associations by taking one piece of stimuli that you never naturally responded to and pairing it with one that you do naturally respond to. So over time, you become conditioned to respond to that neutral stimulus. Observational learning is when you watch what others do and then based on the consequences of that, you act in kind or you avoid that behavior. Operant conditioning, finally, is learned associations. However, it's when a response is more or less likely to happen depending on its consequences. So again, where classical conditioning is concerned, we learn by pairing two stimuli. With operant conditioning, we learn by pairing two things, but it's a behavior with its resulting event. Okay, so by that we mean the resulting event is the consequences. Consequences are just results. Okay, they can be positive or negative. We tend to think of them as more negative, but a reward can be a positive consequence. It's just a resulting event. Okay, so this is operant conditioning. Learning because we've associated a behavior with its outcomes, whether rewarded or punished for those. So, the first person to kind of take a more in-depth look at this, we had Pavlov and uh, a guy named J.B. Watson for classical conditioning. We had Albert Bandura for social learning and observational learning. So now we're gonna look at guys that focus in on operant conditioning. The first is Edward L. Thorndike, or E.L. Thorndike, and so he is going to establish something called the law of effect. And the way that he comes to this law, which means it's no longer a theory, it's been tested over and over and over and over and over again and proven to be true, so this is a big deal. Thorndike was studying very hungry cats. Okay, he wanted to see if they would become more efficient, okay, so be much more quick and learn quickly, um, with each escape that attempt they made from this thing right over here, this is called a puzzle box, okay? And basically all that it is is you have to solve a series of sequences in order to get the box to open, okay? So he was trying to see if he could basically um, condition a cat to become more quick at getting out of that box. And the way that he did that was to kind of facilitate it, he put some food right on the outside of that box. So the cats had been deprived of food for a significant period. They were very hungry. Okay, so these hungry cats were put in the puzzle box. He put food on the outside and he wanted to see how long it would take them to escape to get out and how quickly those responses would kind of set in to their minds and be remembered. And so he learned that when he put that reward there, the cats became very efficient at getting out and so that's where we get the law of effect okay it states that any behavior that's followed by a positive consequence is more likely to be repeated okay so we refer to this as a reinforcement now on the other hand any behavior that is followed by a negative consequence is less likely to be repeated okay this is basically a punishment so with that in mind, that's the route we're going to go within operant conditioning. We're going to be taking a look at reinforcement and punishment and how all that factors into things because at the end of the day, those are both consequences that are attached. Reinforcers are simply more positive uh, and they will cause behavior to increase. And punishments are typically more negative and they will usually cause behaviors to stop. Someone else to kind of further this study of operant conditioning is B.F. Skinner. We've talked about him quite a bit when we've covered behavioral perspectives to psychology, okay? He's just like J.B. Watson. He is all about, you look at only observable behavior. You don't think about the thought processes or anything like that. You just study the behavior. Skinner is going to become very influential with this idea of shaping, okay? He argues that you can establish a new response in a person's behavior by basically getting them to go small little increments or steps that lead up to your desired outcome. 
So if you think about a ladder, okay, you have those small rungs and they're each there for a step to go up and further up the ladder. If you skip a rung, you have a higher likelihood of possibly slipping and, you know, maybe falling off. So you got to go those, you, know, you usually take those step by step by step and you don't skip anything so that way you can get to the top. And that's basically how shaping is. You reward every tiny little step or alteration to a person's behavior until they get to your desired outcome goal. He creates, uh, B.S. Skinner does, something called the Skinner Box or the Operant Chamber, okay? Basically what he attempts to do is he tries to more scientifically measure this puzzle box right here that E.L. Thorndike used. And what he does is he sets it up as this box and it's hooked up to a computer. It's very modern looking, isn't it? This was obviously done a little while ago. And then he would put animals inside this box, specifically rats and mice. And then what he would do is he would basically have everyone just kind of keep track of the rats and the mice and their movements and whether they caught on that when they would push, for example, this lever, food would prop out of this dispenser. Or whether they would recognize that if they, um, you know, got to, if they did a particular activity, a food pellet would drop. And so they started to recognize that those reinforcers in there were causing alterations to these rats and these mice and their behavior. Interestingly enough, we've been able to use shaping especially with regard to animals. Um, something really cool, for example, is that we can uh, basically teach mice through shaping to be able to smell bombs in the ground, landmines. We can get them to sniff it out. Basically, they can be, you know, uh, the, the version of a drug dog. We have, we have uh, basically explosion rats. It's kind of crazy if you think about it. Okay, they can sniff out chemicals in the ground to determine if there are bombs under the ground, which is crazy. Okay, you can train manatees, for example, to um, respond to and differentiate between colors and shapes in toys through shaping as well. So it's pretty crazy if you think about it, the things that they can do to train animals through operant conditioning techniques. All right, so let's talk categories of operant conditioning. This is gonna be where it gets a little confusing, so we will definitely make sure to do some activities with you guys to clarify all of that. First and foremost, positive reinforcement. When we say that this is positive, this means that the behavior is more than likely going to increase by giving a positive consequence. We call it positive reinforcement not because of the level of the consequence, not because it's positive or negative, but because of this part right here, giving a consequence, okay? Anytime we're talking about reinforcement, that means that there's going to be an increase in the behavior. It will continue, all right? So when we talk about giving, that means that we're adding something. So if there's an adding and you've got a plus sign, that's positive. So that's why this is referred to as positive reinforcement. Examples of this would be if you complete your homework, you earn the points for that. Um, you get money at the end of every two weeks for work. Okay, you wouldn't do that work if you didn't get the money attached to it. And if you did, then you are far nicer and a better person than I certainly am. <laughs> Um, if you compete in sports, for example, a lot of times what you guys are competing for is for the win and then for a title and then for a trophy, okay, maybe to go on to state, things like that. So those are positive reinforcements. Now, on the flip side of this, there are also negative reinforcements. We're still getting an increase in behavior because remember, we're talking about reinforcement. Anytime there is a reinforcement, that always means the behavior will increase or be likely to increase. The reason why this is considered negative is because you are taking away or removing or subtracting, hence the negative, a negative consequence. Okay, so you're avoiding or escaping something unpleasant. So examples of this would be you eat to avoid that really uncomfortable gnawing in your stomach when you're really hungry. You take aspirin or Tylenol or Advil to remove a headache. Okay, you buckle your seatbelt to stop a noise. Now think about this. These are all going to be behaviors that will be likely to continue because 
you're able to get out of and escape from something unpleasant. If you take Tylenol, for example, and it gets rid of your headache, you're going to be likely to do it again because it enables you to avoid that unpleasantness. Um, another example of negative reinforcement would be chapstick. Think about it. You put chapstick on your lips because no one really enjoys that feeling of dry, cracked lips. It's kind of uncomfortable and unpleasant. So we put chapstick on to get rid of that unpleasant experience. So if the chapstick works and we don't have any dry chapped lips, we're going to continue to use that chapstick and so therefore there's an increase in that behavior. Another example would be gum, chewing gum. Chewing gum is a negative reinforcement because if you think about it, it's getting you to take away the negative consequence of bad breath. Nobody really likes bad breath. It'd be weird if you did. Okay, so if you know that chewing gum gets rid of that, it wipes it out and you've got a nice minty fresh breath going on from it, you'll be more inclined to carry out that behavior again and chew gum. So that's positive and negative reinforcement. Now we'll move on to positive and negative punishment.